Hi YouTube, welcome to another edition of Horror Hands and for this video I'm going to be talking about the original Universal Monster movies and I'm going to be doing a countdown starting with the movie that I enjoyed the least and working my way up to which I think is the best of these movies. Universal Monsters, it's one of the most requested things that people would like me to talk about on this channel so not too long ago I got the Blu-ray box set with all the movies in and as I say, I'm going to be doing a countdown, looking at the eight original Universal Monsters. And as I say, just putting them in order, starting with the one that I thought was the weakest, up to the one that I thought was the best. Now, this was a really, really hard list to do. I will say that all these movies are excellent. And it was really nice revisiting them and watching them again. Thoroughly enjoyed all of them. So to try and put them in some kind of order was difficult. Quite a few sort of trivial reasons for me putting some of the films further down. But that's just kind of how good every single one of these movies is. But I have uh, I have watched them. I've given it a bit of thought. Got a few notes. So uh, we'll get into this countdown and, uh, and we'll have a look what I think are the best uh, Universal Monster movies. So we've got to start somewhere. And first one on the list is The Phantom of the Opera from 1943. Now I do legit feel that this one is the weakest of the movies. Although it was a great film, I enjoyed watching it again. But there's a few elements to this one that just made me hold it back over some of the other movies. So this is the only one of the original Universal Monster movies that's in colour. So that gives it some benefits, also gives it a bit of detriment. But it's easily the nicest looking of all the films because of the colour elements. And they really make the most of the lavish opera house setting. So the colours in this are really nice and rich. Some beautiful sort of decorations and tapestries and things going on in the opera house. And it just looks exquisite and really exudes class. The detrimental side of that is it just kind of didn't feel like a Universal Monster movie because sort of all of the others are black and white vintage gothic horrors. This one really stood out as something a little bit different. It, as I was watching it, I thought it actually feels more like a Hammer movie, which might be a benefit in itself as well. But it feels much more like one of the early Hammer films rather than a Universal Monster movie, which is one of the big reasons why I kept it further down on the list. The movie itself is good. Uh, Claude Rains is excellent as the uh, the opera, the conductor guy, who gets a little bit screwed over, over by the, uh, the opera and he has this terrible accident which dis disfigures him and then he sort of lurks within the... Uh, the, the, the opera and sort of becomes the, the phantom of the opera. Uh, that's pretty cool. It's, it's an okay story. In terms of his makeup, I didn't think it kind of hit the same levels as Lon Chaney in the 1920s version. So again, it didn't sort of, uh, it didn't quite deliver in, in, that, uh, in that respect. It, it was a little bit lacking. So again, I hold it back for, for that reason. And just ultimately, if someone sort of asked me about Universal Monsters, this is not the one that comes to mind and this is not the one that I feel captures the atmosphere or the essence of what they were. Great movie. As I say, you might like it more from an early Hammer standpoint. Um, but as a Universal Monster film, it's good, but it just kind of doesn't represent the best of what they did. So first one on my list is The Phantom of the Opera. Next up, we have The Mummy from 1932 which is an excellent movie. Don't be fooled by me putting it second from the bottom of this list. It really is a great film. It doesn't kind of do anything all that spectacular or do anything all that iconic. It's just a really good film. It kind of comes in, does a great job, entertains and then and then finishes. Uh, but yeah, really enjoyed re-watching this one. And uh, so you have Boris Karloff in this. He plays like the mummy creature which you, you don't saw that much in the film, but then he plays like the, the Imhotep kind of preacher guy who is looking to bring back his uh, ancient queen and is looking for victims to, to fulfil that. And he has a great role in this film. He might be a slightly better role than Frankenstein in terms of his performance because he has a little bit more 
to do and say in this film. He doesn't do a great deal. He kind of stands around a lot and says a few things uh, in a menacing way. But he has a real presence and really does kind of command the scenery. I, I, did, I thoroughly enjoyed seeing Boris Karloff again in this role. And he has a great look with his facial features and the gauntness and his, and his piercing eyes. Really is a great uh, role and performance for him. I also actually quite like the sort of the love story element of this story, which is not where I would usually go for, but I just thought that was quite an interesting thing that he was trying to, as I say, resurrect his old queen. So there was a, like I say, that love, that committed love aspect, which was sort of a bittersweet aspect to the film, but I think worked quite well. It was just an interesting element that they, they brought into it. I like the ancient Egyptian setting. They made it look good. I'm more kind of accustomed to the old Victorian settings of these kind of movies. But again, it was a nice change whilst watching all these to, to go to the ancient Egypt setting and see this film. So yeah, very few complaints about The Mummy. Really good, very enjoyable one of these movies. As I said, I just don't think it's quite as iconic as some of the others, so I kept it down a little bit. Um, but great film, definitely uh, recommended in, in this series. So next up is actually the movie that I often consider to be my favourite of this series. But after re-watching them all, I, I have to keep it at around number six. And I'll explain why, even though I absolutely love the movie. So the movie now is Creature from the Black Lagoon. And when I rewatched it, I, I really liked it, loved every moment of it. But I just kept thinking throughout the film, similar to Phantom of the Opera, it just doesn't quite capture the essence of what these movies were for me. This one sits a lot more effectively in sort of the atomic 1950s monster movie type type genre. So anything with like Them, Black Scorpion, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, that kind of 50s sci-fi horror. This is where Creature from the Black Lagoon really belongs not in the vintage 30s universal monster movies so again if someone was to say to me now what's the quintessential vintage universal monster it wouldn't be creature from the black lagoon for that reason but other than that i absolutely love this movie it's a monster movie it's a monster that comes from the water which is just absolutely right up my street incredible makeup on the creature it just, just even now it still looks fantastic and the underwater cinematography is still incredible it's both creepy and beautiful and the shots of the creature swimming uh, underneath the woman are just really amazing to see uh, sort of great moral message behind this as well and uh, and yeah it, it is a great 1950s monster movie and one that i absolutely love I just can't, in terms of the Universal Monsters, it just doesn't feel like it's from the same ilk, which is why I held it back a little bit in that respect. Um, but amazing movie, you, you, yeah, yeah, iconic horror film, definitely recommend Creature from the Black Lagoon, but just don't expect kind of the, the dark, vintage, gothic horror of some of the, these other movies. Next up, we have The Wolfman from 1941. So the classic tale which sees Lon Chaney Jr. get attacked by a, a wolf and he in turn becomes a werewolf, he becomes the wolfman. And uh, yeah, very enjoyable film. Lon Chaney is really good in it. I love the silver cane that he gets in the film. That's pretty cool. The wolfman looks awesome. I still love the look of the wolfman. The transformation scene is, of course, very dated now. It's one of the kind of the, the dissolve shots where it, it goes from shot to shot. Um, which is not the best, but still kind of cool to see how they did it back then. On that note, I've kind of held the wolf fan back a little bit because I think there's other films that have been along over the centuries that have shown werewolves and the transformation a lot more effectively and used some really cool practical effects, which has sort of dated this movie a little bit. And like I say, I only had little reasons for keeping some movies back. But other than that, this is a, another really good film. You've got quite a bit of sympathy for Lon Chaney because he's sort of an unwilling werewolf. He's just sort of a victim of this werewolf attack. And there's quite a nice relationship with him and his dad in the movie. And sort of, I won't give away the ending, but it's 
it's got a, a quite a heartfelt ending and and yeah it's, it's it's wrapped up really well so yeah another just really good universal monster movie film and you're getting into the more iconic territory with this one as well and kind of what they were all about at least for me so uh, so yeah number um five on the list is the wolfman okay we're at number four now but we really are into kind of the pinnacle territory any of these movies are excellent and all iconic and must see kind of vintage horror movies so at number four we have dracula from 1931 bella lugosi's iconic performance of the count i have to say watching this one again out of all of them i think this one looks the best of all the movies in terms of that gothic creepy victorian look got the shots of like the horse-drawn carriage going along the countryside uh the dimly lit victorian streets it's absolutely fantastic just what i was kind of uh expecting and remembering from these kind of films so that was great probably the best introduction of the universal monster as well uh count dracula studying his, on his stairs uh, greeting jonathan harker and doing the whole children of the night thing you get a shot of bella lugosi sort of piercing hypnotic eyes that was really cool uh, great characters in this one all round and uh yeah just as i say like a quintessential vintage universal monster movie this, this one really is a a must see and one that i would highly recommend very quiet movie i forgot how quiet it was other than kind of a little ditty at the beginning and the end of the film don't think there was any music in it so it made for quite a quiet film because there's a few pauses and things like that so that was um kind of a bit unique I, I haven't seen a movie like that for a long time that is that quiet and have has such large pauses between dialogue and and sound and things like that so that was interesting but really enjoyed really enjoyed watching this one again great to see all the iconic moments and yeah this one i would i have this down as a, a must see of these kind of universal monster movies At number three, we have Frankenstein, which every inch of this movie is just iconic horror. It's an absolute joy to watch. I have said before, it is arguably the most iconic horror movie uh, ever. Uh, one of the very best Universal Monster movies. A wonderful tale exploring sort of both life and death and the, and the consequences around that and sort of the moral aspect of, you know, creating life and things like that, uh, represented amazingly in Boris Karloff's Frankenstein's monster creature, who is still both kind of uh, pretty terrifying, yet has you have a lot of sympathy for him as well. And yeah, just an, uh, just an excellent movie. Got to say again, from, from re-watching re these movies, a lot of credit should go to Colin Clive. He, he really does make this movie. I mean, Boris Karloff is the iconic creature, but I really feel that Colin Clive is the heart of this movie and really made it as good as the film was. Uh, unfortunately, he would die a few years later from, uh, I think, tuberculosis. He was a, a big drinker and got a lot of health, uh, health problems uh, from that and died in around 1937, I believe. But, uh, but yeah, he was absolutely fantastic in this. I forgot just how good his performance is in the movie. Um, but not not a great deal to say about Frankenstein, other than it's it's still excellent. It's still wonderfully made. The makeup and the look of Frankenstein is still the the look to to go for. And yeah, absolutely must see of of this uh, series. Really enjoyed watching Frankenstein again. Now coming in at number two, which might be a surprise to some people, is the Invisible Man. Now, I was watching this, and I actually made notes when I was watching this movie, and the first thing that I wrote down while I was watching this film was underrated. This film is such an underrated movie, and more people should definitely see The Invisible Man. So in this one, uh, Claude Rains, he's a scientist on the run, and he has devised a serum which can turn you invisible. So when we first see him in the movie, he's dressed in that sort of the bandages with the the sunglasses and the coat and everything look really cool look he looks awesome when he's when he's done up so that you can see him and of course whenever he takes anything off he is invisible you can't see him 
and uh, it's, a, it's a really good one. It's got a bit of humour in it, this one has, which works. Some of these do employ a bit of humour, and it doesn't always land for me, but this one gets a bit playful with it at times, and I, I did like that. Uh, and also Claude Rains, he is pretty creepy as this kind of like, maniacal, invisible uh, scientist guy. It actually reminds me a little bit like, of like a comic book villain, if they'd have done such a thing in, in the 30s. Uh, this was kind of like that. But I, I have to say, the main reason for watching The Invisible Man is the visual effects, which are incredible. For 1933, they are amazing, and they still hold up really well now when he's kind of unravelling his bandages and taking off his, his clothes and the invisible parts of him start to emerge. It just looks incredible. And then he might be invisible but holding something and, and just that's floating around in the air. It's really, really good at how they do it. And I was really surprised how how well it still holds up. It still looks fantastic. And like I say, it's actually a really ent entertaining film. You know, if anyone is thinking that like, films from the 30s are too old and too dusty to, to really enjoy, Invisible Man is a prime example that they, they really can still be very entertaining. So I I wanted to give this one a bit of credit and bump it up there a little bit because, as I say, I think it's really underrated. So uh, number two is one that uh, you definitely should check out, and that is The, uh, the Invisible Man. So, after watching all eight of the original Universal Monsters, I have to say my number one is Bride of Frankenstein. And I didn't know it would be. It's been a long time since I've watched this one. Didn't remember very much of it. But I was so impressed with this movie and what they did and how they built from the first Frankenstein movie. So... They really kind of beef this one up, which is, you know, is what all good sequels should do. Uh, but there's just a lot more going on, a lot more character work. So I love the um, Dr. Pretorius, the sort of villain, villainous doctor that kind of gets Frankenstein to start doing what he was doing. He's really good, very sinister. And I like that kind of back and forth with them and, and the reasons for him uh, making Frankenstein get into this again. The process of bringing something back to life through like the electricity that's kind of shown a lot more it's a lot more intense you see the process uh, in much more detail than what you saw in the first film I really like that scene that was really cool Frankenstein's monster as well gets a lot more kind of character development in this one so he spends more time walking around the countryside I love the interaction he has with the blind guy he, he goes to the blind guy's how so he isn't scared of him and they uh yeah they they sort of kind of become friends briefly and he teaches him that he doesn't need to fear fire teaches him how to smoke i'm <laughs> not sure about that but at the time you know it's, it's just a really nice interaction um that they have uh, of course the bride is awesome she's totally iconic great performance by uh, elsa lancaster there um, it, it almost it almost didn't have the number one spot. There was just one bit about Bride of Frankenstein which didn't work for me, and it was the humour side of things, particularly from the, the the screeching woman. I don't know if she was like a servant lady or a gypsy. Her name was Minnie, played by um, Una O'Connor, and she just kind of brought an element of humour that I didn't think was needed and didn't really work for the film and she was just constantly like oh when i get my hands on him and it just it's a great movie it's a great horror film it didn't need her kind of running around shouting and, and having that comic relief so when i was watching that i thought yeah i'm gonna knock this one down a bit because she's annoying me but actually the movie was so good i'm still putting it as as number one as as the best of the universal monster movies and uh, you know for in terms of recommending them to people it's got kind of everything. It's got the vintage horror look and feel to it. It's got some really good moments, like I say, the the whole bringing the creature back to life. That's a pretty pretty intense scene, and it looks really good. Uh, great performances. You get to see plenty of Frankenstein's monster. Great interaction between the two scientists, Dr. Pristorius and Frankenstein himself. Colin Clive's great again. So, yeah, my number one uh, was Bride of Frankenstein. Really enjoyed the whole thing. 
So that is my countdown, my ranking of the Universal Monsters. Let me know what you think about that, guys. Like I say, it's a very difficult one to put together. It, it may change drastically over time if I watch them again. But that's kind of from the notes that I've made and, and what I thought about them. That's what I've come up with it. Let me know what you think. Do you agree with that? If not, what order would you put these movies? Uh, I'd really love to know. So thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for more videos.